Hi, everyone. Welcome to Six Figure Authors, the show that helps you take your writing career to the next level. I'm Andrea Pearson, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Lindsay Baroker. And I'm Joe Lalo. And today we are interviewing Joe Lalo. Um, in case you aren't aware of who he is, he, like I said with Lindsay's interview, he is a co-host of this podcast. And um, most of our questions come from listeners, but I think we've got a couple in there, in there that are from Lindsay and me and just kind of strewn throughout. Um, and we're going to try to make it more of a discussion, but it, this is all about Joe. And so Joe, I hope you're available and ready to juggle because that has been requested. <laughs> the, uh, the juggling balls are in that orange bucket there. Awesome. <laughs> so those of you listening, you're going to want to catch this on YouTube. So, um, but before we get into interviewing Joe, we actually wanted to talk about um, a couple of things that we've noticed across the interwebs lately, because I mean, things right now is, are really stressful. There's a lot going on and money is short and stress is high. And so we wanted to talk about um, actually, Lindsay, I'm just going to hand it off to you because I know that you, this was her idea. And so I'm just going to let her explain it. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about some things that we personally have done to kind of boost our backlist titles. And I thought this would be a, just a good brief topic to cover because a lot of people are finding it hard to be super productive right now. And maybe you're not getting that next novel out as quickly as possible. But if you have some out already, there are quite a few things you can do to kind of boost the backlist and try to get it selling again, especially on you know maybe older series that you've already finished up so we're going to discuss that a little bit and just to uh, tease you for the joe interview he's going to be talking about writing and selling short stories and i'm um, planning out a series and some of the things he's uh, doing with jug not just juggling but uh, i don't even remember what the rest of the questions were about but there's some good marketing stuff in there and you know just making a full-time income that kind of stuff so we will jump into that with joe shortly but first um, we just made a little list that we're going to kind of go through. Um, like I said, these are all things I've done or for the things I'm mentioning, and then we'll get Andrew's and Joe's insight too. So one thing is that if you've got an existing series that you finished up, maybe it's kind of just been hanging out for a year or two, you can write a new sh short story or novella that ties into the finished series, but it also works as a standalone, so you can basically promote it on its own. Um, and then it kind of, maybe it's got the same characters, you know, maybe it's a backstory, anything that's, you know, you actually know more now probably about writing than when you wrote the original series. So you just think about what kind of awesome story could I write now with my characters that is the kind of thing that would lead them to want to go check out book one. This is actually one of the first things I did accidentally uh, to get my first series selling was give away a free short story, which wasn't that much of a time commitment. I think I already had it written <laughs> at the time. So um, that was one of the things I've done and I've done it a couple other times since. Uh, have you guys done anything like that? Uh, I, I find that I end up doing that a lot, uh, particularly when I'm being in during periods of time when I'm most interactive with my fans, either via the newsletter or via the, the Facebook page. Uh, I find I end up doing that when I don't realize how long it's been since I released something in a given series and people start asking and I'll be like, Oh, uh, well, that's what I'll, I'll do a newsletter perk for that. And I would throw those out. I've done probably a half a dozen of those over the years. So it's, it's pretty effective. And, and Lindsay promised me that I wouldn't need to think during this part of the, the podcast. Um, but yeah, I've done, I've done that. It, it really does. It does help. It gets interest going again and just makes, I don't know. It gives you a little bit of a break from whatever, you know, you're currently working on. And you can make the choice whether you want it to be like a, a book funnel thing where they have to sign up for a newsletter. I would probably in this case, just make it permanently free and out there everywhere. Uh, if you're in KU, you may want to just stick with Amazon or you can make it free on the other sites and then just don't put in, you know, like here's the rest of the series, uh, you know, as far as they know, if it's wide and free, that can be the only thing out there. They may find it and be disgruntled. But if you ever someday want to take that series wide, then maybe you've made a few readers, you know, out there. Um, so the next thing I have on my list that uh, I've done this quite a lot and I haven't for a while and I maybe I will again soon is just joining together with, you know, maybe eight other authors that are really closely in your niche and um, taking each of you takes a book one. This is going to require wide for the most part because doing this stuff with KU throws a wrench in things because um, you need to have the rights to be the exclusive publisher of a book that's going into KDB Select, KU. But um. So if you're wide, you can take your first book one, 
it can be free or you can make the series 99 cents, but these are still very effective. These are the kind of things that, you know, I, I've been in some that we just let it ride. We just let it be permanent free out there with like eight epic fantasy titles, you know, and this obviously this book one led into the rest of my eight book series. And, you know, I, especially on the other sites, but even on Amazon, uh, you may find that you continue to get downloads and you can get this rolling with sort of minimal promotion, uh, minimal money spent. Basically, all these eight authors are going to email their list. Hey, check this out. So you've got at least their readers checking it out and you'll probably get some steam too. You can try to get some uh, inexpensive promos out there. Is, is this something you, I know you guys have done it because I think I've been, I've been in a ton of these box sets with Joe. I, I think maybe Andrea, we've been in one together. I don't remember. Yeah, I think um, I think right now we're we're ramping up on a sci-fi one with our with our book ones. Uh, but yeah, I've been as, I've been in this a lot, and it's tricky at first. It seems like it might not be doing anything because you often aren't the one tracking the sales on it. But uh, I at least a couple times a month we'll get an email or a comment that implies that they discovered me because of one of these and they moved on to my other books. So it's it can be really effective in like a stealthy and trickle sort of way if it's a long term one. Yeah, they've, they've, um, that's pretty much the way it's been for me too. Like just hearing from people who found me and they're like, it'll, it was one of those 20 book box sets, but, and I was in one of them, I was towards the end, but they, you know, I still get emails every now and then saying, Hey, I finally made my way through the box set. And, and I mean, it's, it's also good. A lot of, I mean, they're not so popular anymore. It was pretty much a huge fad, you know, doing those huge box sets, but you can still do them. And I mean, even if you have you know, five books in the box set, you know, something like that would still be very beneficial right now. And it's using stuff you've already written. So the time investment is pretty minimal. And I'd say almost everyone I've been in, if not everyone has just used, like somebody had a cover that they purchased like one of those pre-made ones, you know, and so it's like a $50 investment for the cover. And then, like I said, you can decide if you guys want to spend a lot of money on promoting it or not. A lot of times if it's free or 99 cents, that and alone will be very helpful in selling it. And I think the main reason they're not as popular now is just because so many people are in Kindle Unlimited and KDP Select and exclusive with Amazon. So this is really going to be helpful if you're wide. Uh, people are always saying like, how can I sell more books wide? You know, this, this has been very effective for me. And like Joe said, it's not usually like this goes out and suddenly you get a thousand sales of your book too. It's very much the kind of thing where they just kind of trickle in month after month, which is great. <laughs> Steady income is nothing to uh, turn your nose up at. All right. And then, you know, obviously you can run a sale on book one. And, you know, uh, we talked about this in one of the Dave and Gogrin episodes where we were summing up uh, Nink stuff, I believe, if you want to poke back through the backlist. But, you know, talking about ways you can also at the same time run a sale on some of the middle books in a series, too. And, uh, you know, this may just be I what I'll often do when I is just kind of remind folks like, hey, I have this book one, this book one and this box set are free right now and you know send it out to the newsletter set put it on my facebook author page and i'm i'm super impressed with how many people will like share and how many downloads i'll get even though i you would think these people have already read these books but uh if you get to the point where you have multiple series you know that's not going to be true people are signing up for your list every day that have just discovered you through this whatever your current front list series is so this can be pretty effective even if you don't throw much money at it uh, i've occasionally done like the Facebook author page, here's this, 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 it's free, and then I'll boost the post or something. But um, I, I don't know, what do you guys think? I, I find that perma-free book one, people always say, oh, it's overrated, it's not that big of a thing anymore. But I don't know, I feel like it really keeps things trickling along, uh, especially on the other sites, but even on Amazon too. Yeah, I've got perma-free book ones in three different series, and uh, it has allowed me for probably the past four or five well I, technically for my entire career it has, it has allowed me to uh, get by with virtually no like ongoing advertising i would only really advertise in bursts around promos i'm just now moving away from that which i believe is one of the questions i'll be answering but also uh doing the the discounting other like mid books i'm doing that right now because i just released book six of the book of deacon every other book in the series has been discounted by at least a dollar and it hasn't increased my income markedly, but it has increased the number of book sales because obviously I'm selling more books, but making less off of them. But more book sales on the early books is going to lead to more book sales on the later books and the prices ramp up with each one. And eventually I'm not going to be discounted anymore. So I think it's been a pretty worthwhile thing. I think probably if I had arranged for a little bit more promo on it, it would have been a force multiplier. But as it is, I think it was definitely worth doing. And I'm, in fact, I'm leaving it up till the end of the month. I was actually going to end it today but I decided it's going well enough. I'm going to keep it through until uh, 
may and by the way joe i already said this but congratulations book of deacon is something those of us who listen to the other show like we've heard about it for years so it's kind of exciting that you know <laughs> it's tied Thank off you very much it's exciting yeah Anyway, um, yeah, I still have permafreeze. Right now, I currently have a box set that's permafree, and it's from my my series that sells the least. And it honestly, it works still. You know, I still get, I still get downloads and sells on the rest of the series uh, based off of that permafree box set. And it's a box set, so there's three more books after it. So there's three, one, two, three in the box, set, and then. Th- four, five, and six, whatever, and, and in the next box set or following up. But because it's not a series that sells really well, that's why I, I give away the first three books. And I found that when I had the first book up at per, as periphery, it wasn't as effective, but having the first three up is really effective. And so people, it gives them a chance to get into the, into the series. And then because like I know, like I said, it's not a strong series. It's not a strong selling series. It doesn't feel to them as much of a of a money commitment because they got the first three books for free. And I, I've done that with my 10 book series. It's not currently up. That first book box set is not currently up as a permafree. Um, but I, I mean, permafree still work for me. They've never worked as hugely for me as they have for say Joe and Lindsay back when they were making $3 billion, um, based off of one permafree. It is harder now, but it still works. I, when people say it doesn't work anymore, I'm like, well, what, what were you doing before? Were you getting like 50,000 downloads a day on it or something? <laughs> yeah, I actually, I think Joe actually did better than I ever did with his first book of Deacon book. That thing was just like always at the top of the free list back when Amazon had a top 100 free list. And I'd only be able to like get it up, mine up there when I got a promo or something. But um, yeah, yeah right. It was up there for a while. I, I wish I knew exactly why or how. I just think it had a good cover and good timing. Yeah, you got rocking covers before I did. Like it took me a while to kind of find my way in the cover design front. <laughs> but uh, you know, just right now I've got a couple of box sets that are free. Same as Andrea, they're like one through three. I usually make them free if I can get a book bub, but that was like six months ago and I still haven't changed it back because so many people are still downloading it. Uh, and like there's five more 499 books after that in the series that they can go on and buy if they're interested. And I've also found that if they read the first three, they're a lot more likely to continue on than if they just read the first one, especially in my Dragon Blood series, because book one was a complete standalone. <laughs> it was never meant to be a series. So I didn't set it up at all to be a series. But my book three, yeah, that sucker was a series. All right, so the last one I want to mention, and I'm going to pass this off to Joe after I make my comment, because he's done it even more than I have, is that, you know, you've kind of finished a series, like I think, Joe, your Book of Deacon trilogy was <laughs> was how it was for quite a while, and I had seven books in my um, Dragon Blood series, and I got the itch, I was like, it was probably had been wrapped up for like two or three years, and I'm like, well, let's go do an eighth book, because I was also doing this spinoff series at the same time, and I just thought, as long as I'm back with these characters and in this world, I'm going to write book eight. And I would say it was not as successful for me as a book. I, the books I wrote earlier, they were kind of like coming out a few months apart. They were in the core series because nobody was really expecting it. It was like, oh, surprise book eight that you didn't know was coming. So it kind of took a while to get rolling, but it's done fine. And it's certainly paid for itself. And it, what it is is a chance for you to like promote that series again too. And if you sell well enough, that you can get in the top rankings, you know, on Amazon for your categories. P- people might go check out the book one. Uh, and in my case, this series was never in Kindle Unlimited. So I don't know if I got a whole lot of like time in the top 100 for Epic Fantasy with the new installment. But, you know, it was fun. The hardcore readers loved it. And it, it was between that and the spinoff series, it has gotten a lot of more people to check out the series that had been done since like 2016. Mm-hmm. And, and Joe, do you want to talk about like, cause I feel like you've written all these prequels and, you know, like, I mean, and that's good. Like, that, you know, this was your most successful series. So it makes a lot of sense to just like, we'll lean into that and put out more stuff. So do you want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, yeah. Technically the book of Deacon was just supposed to be the book of Deacon trilogy. Uh, and if you read the first three books, they come to a pretty satisfying ending, but uh, you know, I had released them accidentally fairly rapidly and I developed a pretty good fan base after about, you know, by the time the third one was out. So I did some prequels. I did some short stuff. Uh, but Book of Deacon 3, uh, The Battle of Varel came out in 2012. And then I wrote some sci-fi. I wrote some steampunk. And then I went back to the series in 2015. So it was a pretty long lag. And I wrote Book 4. 
And book four is probably like by the money, the most successful book in the series, just because it had, it had certainly had the best launch of any of my books. Most of my other stuff didn't catch on until the first one went free. But this one had a really good release and uh, it, it really boosted interest in the beginning of the series because some people were seeing this as their first book of mine because it was, again, three years since the previous one had come out and they would just, oh, well, I don't know about that, but what about this? Oh, the first one's free. And it was pretty effective. Uh, and because I only release about one book a year in each series, to a small degree, I'm always doing this. Uh, and it's worked really well up until about two years ago. In the past two years, new, in, new installments of old series haven't been as effective, possibly because we're getting further and further from the beginning of the series. I mean, again, this is the year I'm releasing book six of three different series. Uh, but yeah, uh, I just found that in one, on one hand, when you do a rapid release, uh, people remain interested in the series. On the other hand, when it's been a while, you can make the new release an event which especially if you got most of your fans, as it was the case with the Book of Deacon, if you got most of your fans from a specific series and you haven't written in it for a while, there's a lot of people on your mailing list who have just been waiting for that. <laughs> and it, it can translate into a pretty, a pretty big spike up front and a pretty good long tail afterward. Of course, it is a little more of a time commitment to write an entire new novel in, a, in this series. So, uh, the other things we mentioned, I think you could maybe do in a few days or a week, get together. So uh, definitely up to you what you want to do. And I realized I skipped one, so I just really quickly will say also kind of in the vein of multi-author box sets, you, if you don't want to do that or if you all want to do something new for your readers which is going to be getting every all the readers are going to check it out for something new right as opposed to a box set where they've already read the book one potentially but you can also do a short story and do an anthology with several other authors again you know you want tightly knit related to your genre and this is um again i would recommend you're doing a series that is completely designed to not only tie into your other series, but to be awesome independently. So it really makes people want to go check out like, wow, loved the banter between these characters. I have to go read the series that these characters are from. So that is one more thing. Do you guys have any more thoughts on that before I, I'll pass it back to Andrea to jump into the first question for Joe. Um, I'll just say I did this uh, a while ago with what turned out to be um, I provided a Book of Deacon story that was a direct prequel to the first Book of Deacon, as in like it ended hours before the first Book of Deacon started and introduced a character by name that had previously been only known by legend. And it turned out to like the actual anthology did reasonably well. Like it certainly paid for itself considering it was a very low investment. But uh, the, the story became popular enough that I ended up doing a standalone release of it that has sort of paid for itself again because I got a new cover for that. So you can sometimes get a darn good story out of this that you were maybe not planning to write otherwise. And, and Joe, did you have anything that, you, that you've been doing? I mean, because I'm going to go ahead and talk about things that I've been doing that it, you know, are free or cheap advertising or whatever. No, I think most of the stuff I do for, for, for this sort of thing has been covered in the other stuff so far. Awesome. Um, so some of the stuff that I've been doing, like um, exclusive content, we talked a tiny bit about that. And then I do giveaways to encourage um, reading. So to my newsletter, and what I do is it's a giveaway anybody can enter, but um, then I'll have like a bonus question for those who have read the books that will be something like, what did you think of such and such reaction to the event? Or what did chapter eight start with? You know, what were the words that started with? Just things like that. You have to make sure that it's not um, it's not based on purchase. And so it's a bonus question is what I usually do. Um, and then book club events. So have hosting book clubs from your Facebook groups or just anywhere. You can do it even over email where you send out questions and then have them answer them. Or if you don't want to get a lot of emails, have them go to a Google form and fill in their questions, which also actually works really well because then they're clicking <laughs> when they, when they open your email and that helps them engagement with emails, you know, um, you can also do a retweet giveaway where the goal is tons of retweets for a specific or a special thing. So like you could be doing offering a, you know, your books in paperback as a giveaway and then people who retweet get a free book or they get entered into, or you could do it where if you get like a thousand retweets, everybody on your newsletter list gets a free story. So then that gets it so that people join your newsletter list and they're also giving you intention for your, your, um, <clears throat> your event that you're doing the retweet or whatever. Um, 
And um, just as an FYI, um, I think Facebook, I think it's still against the rules for you to try to get people to like your page when it's a giveaway. Um, I look into that. So before you decide to go out and do something like that, um, but anything that get, engages fans or gets you involved with them, I mean, it's all free. It just takes time. And then you just need to decide what you want to do. Anyway, another idea I had was like um, artwork and it doesn't have to be commissioned or professional artwork it could be even something that you create so my readers i did like a house plan of a house that um like it was this old house and it's like this is where everything takes place just like a house plan you would look at because i'm kind of obsessed with with houses um, and my readers really like that and so you can do maps of the city where they live just things that you create that's you know would be enjoyed by your fans just again to drum up interest in your books and so right now, everything's really crazy. There's a lot going on out there. Nobody has any money. And that includes a lot of authors uh, and readers too. So just um, it, even if you're just getting people excited about a series that you wrote previously that they've already read, it's still going to be beneficial for you and them in the long run. Anyway, so we're going to go ahead and go into quick questions for Joe. And these are from our Facebook group. Come join our Facebook group if you want to be able to participate in this sort of an event in the future. And um, I'm going to apologize ahead of time in case there are any names that I don't pronounce correctly. <laughs> Lindsay's the pro at pronouncing names. I'm not. <laughs> so. No, I'm not. And I'm also not going to apologize. So there, <laughs> if, you, if you submit to the group, then, you know, take your chances. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Um, okay. So our first question is from Kane Wheatley Holder. And it says, would really love to have you three describe your experiences for the very first book you released. Um, and then she, you know, she's like, sorry if you, I asked that already. She, he, Kane sounds like a guy's name. <laughs> See, look, I'm butchering it already. <laughs> um, like myself, some writers here are embarking on this for the first time. So would really like to hear what happened, the mistakes or not, and how you kept the momentum going after that first, first book released. Okay. Uh, my first book was the book of Deacon. Uh, I actually wrote a gigantic book that I chopped into three pieces. So the book of Deacon is the first third of the first book that I actually wrote. I released it with a terrible homemade cover uh, and I released it for nine ninety nine, and it was not copy edited. And I sold one copy in the first year and then I dropped the price and then to four ninety nine, and I sold another copy. Uh, also I bought the ISBN. So it cost me $10 to do that. So I was like, I didn't spend anything on the book, but was still in the in the red for the first year and a half. I dropped it down to two ninety nine. I sold another copy, uh, but since I had already written books two and three, I just released them the same way, and then I made the first book perma free, and that was like two thousand eleven. And two thousand eleven perma free was a very very effective tactic, and twenty five thousand people downloaded the first book in the course of two or three days. I think it got picked up by a blog called Pixel of Ink that sent most of those people my way. Uh, and I, I, when sell through happened, I, I made $3,000 and then it started to taper off. But I took the $3,000 and I invested it in the covers that are still on the books. And I also got it copy edited. And the copy edit raised my average uh, you know, rating by a full star. So it went from mid threes to mid fours. And uh, my the, the new covers, I got, I was selling five times as many books once I got the new covers on there. And then from there, I mean, I was still working a, a day job. So my writing was still going very slowly, but from there, just uh, at, like Lindsay was saying, I was stuck on the top 100 in the, uh, in the free list. And then if you went down to Epic fantasy, I was stuck in the top 10 for a really long time, mostly because of other books that were perma free at the time, I just had a pretty darn good cover and I had a lot of reviews and it just sort of fed back on itself. Pretty much as soon as they dropped to the, the having the side by side top 100s for free and paid, that stopped being nearly this, as sticky as it was, but it was enough to keep me afloat for, you know, that series was my main moneymaker for at least three years before, uh, before the other two started to get some traction. All right, I guess since uh, Kane asked all of our opinions, I guess Andrea will chime in with short answers. We're gonna try to keep this more of the Joe episode, but um, actually the first thing I published was my Goblin Brothers middle grade 
collection of short stories, which sold about as well as you would imagine it would. At the time, I had no idea. Oh, novels sell better than collections of short stories, and middle grade is really hard to sell in ebooks. I did not know. Fortunately, I had in the works my first Emperor's Edge novel, too. So I, I published that a couple weeks after, and I didn't have any huge success at the beginning. There was not, not many ways to advertise back then. I, the, I was trying Goodreads advertising. They had the first, like, pay-per-click ads for authors out there, and they kind of, I saw a little trickle through. I was selling the book for two ninety nine, dollars and, um, you know, I, I, it worked. Like, there was no expectations for me back then, so I remember when I made a couple hundred a month you know, a month. I think I had two novels then. I thought that was pretty darn good. So it was definitely a gradual thing for me. Um, I figured out Perma Free later, I think with my third release, book one, I was able to make that free. And, and that definitely also for me, I didn't have as good a cover as a show back then, but um, it definitely helped get things rolling. Go ahead, Andrea. Yeah, um, I that that's more the way it went for me, like just a slow start. Um, and I did do middle grade and I didn't realize, I mean, I had um, I've released the first book as free and I didn't have any other books in the series and I had over a thousand downloads in like 20 hours and um, which was really exciting, but I didn't have anything for them to follow up with after. And so it just went slowly. I just, I released two to three novels a year, maybe four novels a year sometimes. And it, it gradually built up from there. It wasn't until I started writing my YA slash um, NA, um, not, you know, series, the mosaic chronicles that things actually went somewhere for me. Um, and I didn't realize it was cause it was middle grade. Middle grade is very difficult to sell. And, you know, it took me a while to also realize that middle grade readers of eBooks are adults, not children. And once I targeted my advertising better, and honestly, in the beginning, I actually spent a lot more money on marketing and advertising than I do now. And I should not have. And so I think people in the beginning are willing to risk on the books that they love, but they don't necessarily get the benefit back. And so I'm always like, just wait, you know, just hold off before you start really putting, pushing in, putting money into your book, you know, anyway, um, Lindsay, you've got the next question, right? I do. Okay. Next question is from Patty Finn. Does Joe think he will ever get over his fear of listening to his own audiobooks? When he mentioned it a few weeks back, I was so happy to learn I wasn't the only one. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. I guess it's linked to imposter syndrome. In an effort to conquer this ridiculous fear, I recently listened to a short story that was published in an anthology last year. I wanted to throw up most of the way through, but somehow I managed to reach the end. Podium did an excellent job with the series I signed to them, but I haven't been able to listen to those novels yet. Would love to hear your thoughts on conquering said fear, Joe. Okay, it still makes me squirm to hear my books read out loud. Uh, I've found if enough time has passed, or if it's different enough from what I'm currently writing, I can usually tolerate it. Basically, if I can forget that I'm the one who wrote those words. I think the thing that bothers me, and it's, it mostly comes from, like, I always have a very low opinion of my own writing. I think that's fairly common. Uh, and when I hear somebody reading it out loud, it means that I know for a fact someone else is reading it. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh my goodness. They are judging me as, as we speak. But yeah, once enough time has passed, it happens actually too when I have to reread my own stuff. If I have been able to forget that I wrote those words or specifically what words I wrote, then I can sort of listen to it as though it was somebody else's stuff and it's tolerable. But like, I have proof listened to the two things that I've produced on my own, the Jade and Book of Deacon 4. I, I did, uh, you know, I paid for through ACX have those made i had to proof listen to them because i wasn't going to hire somebody uh i'd already spent enough money on them to begin with uh and so i had to get through you know between the two of those we're talking 20 hours worth of listening and if you do anything for that long you start to develop a, a tolerance for it so you know i can get through it but it's a grind and i don't like it and i have had plenty of audiobook releases since then that i still haven't listened to i don't think i listened to any of the sci-fi books that it released it's just yeah, it's still, it's just trial by fire and immersion to get through it. That's pretty amazing. You're like, I'm desensitized to my book now. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so our next question for is question is from Scotty Farrell. He says, Joe has said his new rapid release urban fantasy hasn't gone as well as he had hoped. Where does he think things went wrong? What does he think he could have done d differently for better results? Okay, as you as you might imagine, I've thought about this a lot. Uh, I did a, I did a pretty lengthy post mortem on my own decision process, and the most basic mistakes were I was like the story itself is missing some key tropes. 
Uh, now, generally speaking, like it, the content of a book will not lead to poor sales because most of the people who are buying your book haven't read it yet. That's just how book sales go. But uh, even in the blurb and on the cover, I went into urban fantasy with a story that interested me, but was a fairly original idea that didn't ha hit most of the mainstays of the genre. There weren't any werewolves, although there are werewolf-like things that are buried in the story. There were no vampires or anything like that. Uh, I followed the private eye slash film noir mold, which is not the most popular, but reasonably successful. But my main character isn't a detective. He's a photographer. So like none of the, I didn't hit dead on the bullseye on any of these. And I produced a situation where I didn't just have to sell the book. I had to sell people on the idea of the book. And that is an uphill struggle. On top of that, this was my first and so far only uh, foray into being an Amazon exclusive title. It's still, the, those three books are still exclusive to Amazon. And I was stressed because uh, I felt like I was alienating a substantial portion of my readership. These days, about 50-50 uh, Amazon-wide earnings for me mostly because of drops in Amazon sales, but I've always made a fair amount of my money uh, wide. So when I knew that I was going to be doing this exclusive as an experiment, I took steps to try to make sure that my non-Amazon fans would get their hands on the books if they wanted it before it went exclusive. This included doing a two-week early release on Patreon, which only really affected a couple dozen people. And I also did a story bundle that included book one, and that sold probably 500 copies. And I realized afterward, that's 500 copies that I didn't get any rank love for. Like, for all I know, all 500 of those people might have bought it on Amazon. And those would have been 500 day one sales. It would have really helped the launch. And I just just destroyed them by, by doing them on a, on a non-ranked site. Uh, also, Urban Fantasy is expensive to advertise. Uh, so keeping the sales up would have been difficult. And because the first book didn't do so well, the sales of the following books are basically limited by the sales of the first book. So uh, basically, those are the things that went wrong. Everything. Everything is what went wrong. And uh, the problem is, this is book as a three-book series. Uh, I had planned it for five. And I had no, I've heard from a bunch of people, like, I didn't sell zero books. And the people who have read it are like, oh, I can't wait to see what happens in book four. I'm like, book four is not even in the pipeline right now. It, I, I'm, I'm angry at book four. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll eventually have to do it because I, am, I let the inmates run the asylum on this sort of thing. Lindsay and I are here laughing and <laughs> when Joe's saying, you're hilarious, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. So I want to ask in lieu of our backlist conversation, because I think I mentioned I ended up with cover art that basically I, for the characters in the urban fantasy series I'm doing. So I'm planning to do like a prequel, probably like a three book trilogy. I'm already thinking like I can put that together in one audiobook and it'd be like 15 hours. It'd be great. And I'm hoping that that will also like funnel. It's like a second chance to advertise my series and write fun of people into the death before dragon series. So are you thinking of doing anything like that where maybe you write something else in urban fantasy that could tie in or prequel or, you know, something that might give this series kind of a second chance to uh, maybe catch on. Uh, yeah, I probably will. I, because I have the Patreon where I do a lot of short stories, it's almost inevitable that I'm going to write another short story in this setting. Cause again, there are some very popular characters in this setting, but also I haven't done a box set for this yet. And, uh, if I do another release, basically the next release that I do, I'll be able to justify making a box set because it'll have something to lead into. So there is still a chance to resurrect this series, you know, with, with some new stuff. But again, I, I sort of have to dig back in and, and it hurt my feelings. So I'm holding off on that for now. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely do the three book box set for my series too. Eventually that was like my dragon blood series didn't do horribly, but it wasn't until I did that three book box set that established it as a series and got people in it that that really that's become my best set. Like I've made more money from that series than anything else I've written. And that's never even been in Kindle Unlimited and KDP Select. So it's like, yes, you can do it. If you're wide, it's possible. <laughs> Um, but next question moving on is from Dave Hooney to all or anyone. Do you have an exit plan and what might be your triggers? Okay. Um, my original trigger was to abandon ship as soon as I had a month where I didn't earn enough to cover my average monthly expenses. And I realized pretty quickly that with my release schedule, that I'd be jumping the gun. I would have been out of this like six years ago if I had stuck to that because I have so many, uh, uh, I have so much lag between launches that I have a pretty long dip uh, and then all of a sudden my earnings come back up and dip again, I have a sawtooth. So I changed my rules and instead, while I was making a lot of money, I saved up 
basically a full year of expense buffer, separate from my savings, separate from my uh, retirement. And uh, my trigger will be basically when that runs out. When I, when I look and I realize I can't pay my bills without taking something out of savings, then I will you know, have decided that a change is necessary. And hopefully I'll be making changes along the way to make that unnecessary. But uh, my exit strategies, I have two of them. One is the one that I would like to happen and one is the one that will eventually happen because I know that they're not going to work out the way I want them to. What I'd like to happen is as I start to get to the red zone and I realize that without restructuring, I'm not going to be able to keep a full-time authordom, I'll start finding other uh, income to just sort of shore up the, the shortfall. Uh, little stuff that I can let go if I start earning back what I was with, with writing. So like freelance stuff. I've done some freelance stuff. I've, I've done some uh, writing of ad copy in the past for, for other people. That's a weird story. Uh, but, uh, you know, other, or just a part-time job. Like th that's what I would like to do. What's more likely is I will try to hold on as long as I possibly can on the buffer. And then once it runs out, I'll get an office job and just revert to having writing as an extremely profitable hobby because I worked an office job for nine years and two of my best friends are still working office jobs that are have a lot of turnover. So I don't think it will be difficult for me to get a, a, a reasonably good job, especially since technically I've spent the last 10 years running a small publishing firm as far as anybody really cares. That's, that's what we do when we're independent authors. So that's where I am with that. Um, as for me, exit strategy. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, my question would be, what does he mean exit strategy? Does he mean like not relying on this anymore financially or does he mean um, not writing ever again, because I think, I think all of us are listeners <laughs> are, are, all of us are listeners. All of us are writers and writers write. And, and sometimes you have to take a break for a little while, but you go back to writing. And I, one of my things is I, even if I'm not making money, I'm still going to be writing because it makes me happy as a person. Um, the biggest issue I've come into is my, my happiness and my hobby has turned into work and so I have to be really careful. My husband and I took it upon ourselves to find a new hobby for me. <laughs> so um, I, Lindsay and Joe know this, but I've got a, a YouTube, um, a gaming channel on YouTube. And it's just, I've really, really enjoyed it. I release a video once every day and that sounds like a lot, but when it's something you love doing, you don't care anyway. And so, um, and it hasn't come in the way of my writing or anything like that. So I guess you could say that would be an exit strategy. I did get... Um, I've had a couple things happen there that have been pretty exciting. Um, none of them will benefit me financially at this point. And so it doesn't, it's not, I'm not doing it as an, an ex exit strategy, but it could potentially turn into an exit strategy. Um, but I don't really think there is an egg really is one for me because I'm going to write for the rest of my life. Even if I'm, nobody's reading my books, you know, I would do it for my kids. I would do it for the local elementary school because I know they'll t never tell me no because <laughs> we've been doing it for seven years with them. Um, but when it comes to how much money I'm making, I have to weigh how much time I'm putting in versus how much money I'm getting out. And right now I can't put in a whole ton of time because I do have three kids. And so I had, we, um, Nolan and I just had this conversation last week, actually, we were like, how much joy is this bringing me and versus how much stress is bringing me versus how much time I can put in versus how much money I'm getting out. And it wasn't bringing enough joy for it to be causing the amount of stress that it was causing. And so last week we were like, you know what? We're just going to stop stressing about everything. I mean, my royalties are higher, but they're still not back to where we wanted them, where they were before I started, before I started having this last kid, <laughs> before I got pregnant with this last kid. Um, and so, I mean, things are still stressful financially, but um, we've had a lot of things happen on the other end where in our, um, where finances are really, really in a good place for us now. And with the books doing better now, I'm like, you know what? I need to make this be something I'm passionate and I love doing again and not have it be something that's, that's killing me emotionally, you know, because I'm like, like Joe, my feelings are hurt too, Joe. <laughs> my most recent release is not doing super well compared to the, my, all of my releases before that, my series release as in, and I know I'll eventually get the chance to go back and make the money on it because it's sometimes, some series take time, you know, to find their audience, you know, but for now I'm just not re I'm not hanging everything on it anymore. I'm writing it because I love it and it's making life a lot better now. And so for our listeners, if you are 
I mean, you're writing because you love it, not just because you need the money. I mean, most listeners know that if they don't write, they fall apart, right? And so you got to find that balance where it's not that you're going to give up on writing. It's just where, what's going to burn you out and then avoid doing that. Sorry, that was longer than I expected. <laughs> we all had kind of a different take on this because I, I immediately thought exit strategy. Okay, so like I'm going to really a high valuation of my company and sell it and then retire and sail around the world except I get seasick. So that's not my exit strategy, but uh, you mean like Hugh Howie, <laughs> right? I'm going to go on shark tank, you know, as you guys ever watch shark tank and you're like, I'm digital stuff is so much more profitable than actually creating widgets. I mean, gosh. Um, but for me, um, I guess I, I just assume I, I enjoy this. I enjoy writing. I actually keep saying I'm going to like kind of back off. You know, I'm like, oh, I, I'm fortunately in a spot where I could back off to write. Maybe I just want to write two or three, three or four novels a year, which to most people is still a lot. But I'm, I always have so many things I want to do. And I'm like, oh, man, I, I'm going to try this new subgenre. And I want to try this new series. And I have all these ideas for the next thing. That it's, I feel like I've become a workaholic because this is my passion. Whereas back when I worked, was in the army, like, I'm like, ah, was it five o'clock yet? Time to go home, final formation, let's go. But you know, when you're working for yourself, it's like, you're so much more motivated. And I think most people know, like, you know, there's that saying about like, when you work for yourself, you never work a day for the rest of your life. It's like, no, you pretty much work every day for the rest of your life, like way more than you would if you were working for someone else. So my plan is just, um, I would like to get to the point where maybe I could, I don't know if I could ever do traditional publishing full time, but I, I am a little envious sometimes about like, oh, I could just hand the novel off and somebody else could handle all the publishing. So I think that might come more along the ways of like having a, I would say assistant, but you almost need like a partner or something. I'm always envious of the people that have a spouse that, you know, or a kid or something, a grown kid that, uh, you know, they really trust and that really gets it and they can work in the business with them. But so that would probably be me just backing off a little bit, maybe not publishing as much, you know, otherwise I kind of treat this like a job, you know, this money goes to your retirement and then someday if you want to, you can retire or if some medical thing comes up and you need to, you can back out. So I, I pretty much just treat it like a job and I don't have any dreams of like, I'm always hopeful that, <laughs> you know, like Hollywood will want to make a movie and that will become like, suddenly you're so rich that uh, you don't have to worry about anything. But um just treating it like a job and uh, putting some money away to retire if I ever choose to do so. All right, I think Andrea has the next question. I believe you are right. Okay, so, <clears throat> sorry. Um, Kate Sheeran Swed says, I have a question for Joe, and my, that might be Speed, I don't know. <laughs> um, how's your advertising revamp coming? I know you were looking to try new things, and I'm wondering what's working for you and what's not. Apparently mute wasn't working for me. Um, okay, so it's been going okay. Uh, the way that I've been doing it is I, I started with BookBub and I sort of went through some books and I learned how to do BookBub ads reasonably well. Once I had a couple of ads that got me the return on investment I was looking for, I sort of logged that information aside and I moved on to Amazon and now I'm, I'm on to Facebook. And uh, I've been doing pretty decent with return on investment for Facebook ads, like uh, I broke a couple of rules because I've been using my covers uh, for some of my ads and they've worked too. A lot, you often hear that your covers are a bad choice because they don't crop terribly well. Uh, but I've, my covers are pretty big. I can usually crop out a good portion that still has good uh, uh, composition. Um, Amazon ads have been less successful for me. Like I can usually get them to start off like gangbusters. And then they just suddenly stop making sales and just continue eating money, uh, which is usually what Facebook ads did for me. So I managed to completely flip that upside down. They seem like Amazon ads. I probably will still run them at a really, really low bid uh, for like just constant trickle because I have some that have been running since 2017 and they have been actually screwing up my assessment of how well my new ones are doing because every now and then they'll still kick in a sale and I'll be like, oh, oh, that was from the old one. Oh, gosh, darn it. So uh, Amazon, I'm not super blown away. BookBub, it's been a while since I did my tests and I actually intended to use some of the BookBub uh, ads for uh, this most recent release and I just didn't. I just didn't make room in my, in my launch schedule for, for using BookBub ads. So I'll probably get back to those maybe for the next one. Nothing has been a runaway success. Nothing has made me decide that I can go back to the way things were, just run these ads and my, my, my income will be what it was. But 
I've gotten to the point now where I'm comfortable including them in a larger strategy. Uh, in the past, I've been afraid to include them because I was afraid I was just going to lose more money than I was making. And now I've, I've got enough of, a, of an aptitude that I can at least be sure that they're not going to get away from me and I'm going to get some bang for my buck. So up until, up until probably the last six months, my entire uh, ad strategy was basically I would boost a post during uh, on release day uh, and then I would try to get featured ads to stack for the release week. And that would be a book bub or, you know, bargain books here, all of those. Uh, and now I can sort of add this to my toolbox and, and know that it's not going to hurt me. It's too bad that urban fantasy is quite expensive and that that series hasn't been a killer for you because that, the one in, yes, like your one thing in Kindle Unlimited. So I feel like you'd get a lot better return on Amazon ads if you tried it with a series where, People can also borrow. Plus, if it's not selling that well right now, you would actually be able to see like, oh, hey, I'm making like 500 more page reads a day than I was before. But yeah, it's tough to recommend that. I, I feel like with advertising, you kind of got to pick what your proven sellers are that convert really well. And maybe they'll find your other backlist series later if, uh, if they get into it. All right, next question is from Alicia. When I hear Joe talk about his struggles, I always feel a real kinship. I appreciate his take on things. My question is, how do you plan out a series or think, or how do you think authors should plan out a series? I have my own process, but I can't remember if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I've done it a couple different ways, but what it usually boils down to for me is I will pick a starter story that I think will be fun. And uh, I will pick an end point that I can dangle in distance. And, uh, and, and, and over the course of the series, I'll build a couple of trajectories that I can use because that endpoint is the endpoint. Like once, once that event occurs, that sort of should complete the interest in the story. So the, the little mini trajectories are those the things that will drive mid books. So we'll take Free Wrench as, as, a, as an example. It's the most recent uh, uh, series that I've sort of followed through in this way. The first one was relatively standalone. It was uh, it sort of an, it introduced an ensemble cast and gave them, you know, it built the world and all that stuff. And it set up the kind of struggles that they're going to have in the future. And when I saw how that book performed and I saw the reviews and I, I heard how people like characters, I started to plan book two. Book two would start the actual sort of ongoing struggles. So I'd introduce the villain who would be recurring instead of just the villain of the day. And I would start building relationships between characters and stuff like that. And that would sort of drive the books going forward. And then dangling in the future is sort of the ultimate resolution where either we know that our heroes are going to be okay from that point forward, or we know that, uh, uh, you know, the story, there's no more story to be told. I'm not the kind of, you know, rocks fall, everyone dies sort of guy, but you can certainly end a series like that. So yeah, I build series. Usually my, my, the main thing that I do with series, and so far I haven't had to pull this ripcord, is I try to make sure once I get past book three that I can close everything off in one more book. So like if I plan something out for eight books, which I seldom do, I, I very seldom do I plan out a specific number of books. Urban fantasy is the one exception. Um, if I see that it's not selling well, or if I feel like I've, I've sort of run out of fresh thoughts, I try to make sure that all of my loose ends can be tied up with one more book so that I can just finale whenever the heck I want. And it's worked pretty well for me. And it's, it's like I say, with those little mini trajectories, um, they have a weird way of sort of weaving into each other and making it a much more interesting book later in the series, uh, series later in the release process. That's so crazy that you can do that. Cause I'm like with my, my books, <laughs> this most recent series, we were like, this is not doing as well. We should end it earlier. So we ended up adding a novel to the end of it because <laughs> we're like, dang it, we can't get it finished fast enough. So we're like, there's too much material to finish. And, and I, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not good at that. Like my series end up being longer, even if they're not doing very well. So I do admire that <laughs> that you can do that. Um, so the next question is from Bill Thornhill and maybe that's because I'm being, I'm, you know, <laughs> it's like poor financial decision, poor business decision, but ugh, man, um, Bill Thornhill, when did, okay. So when did you most feel like giving up and what got you through it? Uh, okay. So as you might be able to tell from previous statements, when Shards of Shadow, which is the urban fantasy series, uh, sort of sputtered on release, it was a, a punch to the gut. I saw the collective shrug from the market 
and I knew that the overall series performance was going to be limited by the performance of that first book. And I had taken basically the entire year to that point to prepare a rapid release. So I knew that my next three months were being shaped by that first release <laughs> and uh, it was not going to be great. And it really, you know, I mean, it hurt my bank account and it hurt my feelings. Uh, uh, and so, you know, that was a problem. And I felt like I was not, because I had taken so much time to get that prepared, my earnings were already in a pretty bad place to begin with, and they were not helped by the failure of that release. So I, I you know, it, I have not fully recovered from sort of the blow to my ego that came that day. Um, even this most book release, the most recent book release, the Book of Deacon 6, uh, it's probably, well, it's certainly the weakest release in the Book of Deacon series since I started actually making money. Now, it's the sixth book in a series that's been going since 2010. So that's one thing. Uh, there's a pandemic going on. That's another thing. But having things to blame the performance on does not help me or my bank account feel better. So I try not to make those lists of excuses. If I could make money making excuses, I would be very rich. So what's gotten me through it? I have a handful of very vocal fans. Uh, some of them are in my Patreon chat. Some of them send me emails fairly regularly. If I'm lucky, some of them send me fan art. The fan art is surprisingly good at making me feel better. But basically, when I released book six, for example, again, I wasn't impressed with the, with the, uh, the release of book six or the book of Deacon. It's only a week. I mean, who knows? It's, I don't have a lot of track record for it yet, but I was not blown away. Um, by the end of the day, I was getting emails and tweets from people who had basically waited until midnight, got their hands in the book and blasted through it in the first day. And they're like excited about a book that I was afraid people wouldn't like because it's the, you know, it's the end and you can really botch an ending. Uh, and just basically like when I get that, when I get, when I hear from fans and I realize that there are people out there enjoying my stuff, it reminds me that even if I divorce the, the, the money from it, even if it's just, books being sent out into the ether there are people who are enjoying them and that makes them worthwhile so like even if i end up having to get a real job again as though this wasn't a real job even though i end up getting a job that i would consider real before this was my real job um these are still putting out worth putting out there because people like them and books you know that's all I really, really need is to is for someone to enjoy it and if the money will come from somewhere else if I need it to but just hearing from fans uh, is, is really good at making me realize that the voice in my head is a liar. <laughs> and so that's sort of how I get through it is just, just, just talking to fans and having fans talk to me. I believe the words you used in your note was dirty liar. Dirty liar. Yes. The <laughs> voice in my head is a dirty liar. <laughs> well, and I think because we've been talking about backlist stuff too, it's always important to remember that just because one book doesn't do as well as you hope, it's not like the last chance, you know, I, I and, but I, I do think it's great when you can take encouragement from people really loving this story. Like, you know, my urban fantasy series hasn't done as well as I hoped it would, but I'm not surprised, but I've had some really nice feedback from readers and that certainly does help if, uh, if you're not killing it. But uh, I'm always like, yep, let's plan this. How are we going to get more in with the next, you know, plan the next thing, get more people into that series. There's, there's plenty of ways you can get them, you know, especially if you wrote a good story at its core that people love. Um, and for our listeners, um, how many of us have written urban fantasies re recently that we're disappointed in? <laughs> All three of us. All of us. Yeah, it would be interesting to know, you know, uh, we had KM Shea on, she did really well with hers, and she was coming out of fairy tales. No, and let's not talk about people who are doing really well. Oh, but <laughs> just I'm just kidding. saying, and she didn't, she, her covers were not as expensive and everything, so, you know, I think none of us really did the two trope to market thing, and so that's a choice we made, and so we have to accept that maybe it's not going to take off like rocket fire, and also it, it helps if you're committed to one genre <laughs> instead of a genre hopping, which Joe and I especially are notorious for. So we're probably that's why we like to get guests on that do the right thing, and but we hopefully we are a little bit encouraging and that we're all we're able to do this for a living, you know, not necessarily doing all the right things, just trying to write what we want and market it the best we can. All right, next question for Joe is from Bethany. Joe's very down to earth take and honesty about not doing what works all the time, but still making a living is so supportive to hear. Obviously, I read ahead. Uh, it gives me hope that doing what I have the resources to do will eventually build. So three questions. 
I'll go ahead and ask them all because I see Job has notes to answer them all. Ask them all at once. Number one, I'd love to know how his dragon pizza oven story is doing. Two, what are some of his go-to strategies for talking to newbies or wannabe writers? Three, how does he answer the question, so what do you do? All right, um, so the first question, Pizza Dragon has earned back the cost of the cover and the edit. That was mostly because uh, I, I knew that that was, there is no genre for Pizza Dragon, really. So I knew that it was gonna be a hard sell. So I sort of structured it such that, it, again, also was part of a story bundle in the beginning. Uh, I structured it so that I, it would make its money back in the first big punch, and then I didn't particularly care. And that's good news because it made $75 last year. Uh, for the entire year, it made $75. And I split that money with the artist who inspired the book. So uh, it was for me, and, uh, and that's good enough for me. But the, oddly enough, uh, it did spawn a sequel story because, again, it doesn't matter if 15 people buy a thing, you're going to have at least one of them asking for their sequel. And, and uh, I can write a short story in a weekend. So the Pizza Dragon, act, now it technically has two. It has a prequel and a sequel story. Uh, both of them have recently been released in anthologies. So I guess if I really get complicated, I can add to that $75 that it made. But I haven't sliced and diced to that degree. The second question, when it comes to uh, newbie writers, I usually ask if they have questions because I feel weird pontificating to someone who might not actually be looking for advice. Not everybody's trying to turn a hobby into a career, which is usually where my, my newbie uh, advice leads. Uh, when they want advice, I recommend that they actually write the book. A lot of the people I talk to who are earlier in their career aren't actually, they haven't got a book done yet. They're planning a book or they're in the process of writing a book and they are building worlds and they're, they're mapping out characters and they're coming up with plots and it's a lot of fun, but they're not actually finishing a book. And I always try to tell them, you need to have something that you can sell. Um, so I try to like, a friend of mine has a great idea for a book and he's still marking on the map for the book. So uh, I've written full series since he started working on that map. You just got to finish. And then once you've finished one, you can move on. I also give them a rundown on the absolute cheapest way to publish because I feel like if, uh, if you're keeping costs down, especially early on, it's a good way to increase the chances that you'll keep at it. Because if you, you, can, you can throw away thousands of dollars. If you have $8,000 on a book release because you did multiple rounds of development of editing and you, you got a superstar uh, uh, artist to do the cover and then you, t you poured a lot of uh, advertising into the release and it doesn't go anywhere, you're never going to do that again. Again, it will hurt your feelings. So uh, I, try to, I try to teach people, you can get a book released passably for $0. I would not recommend it because you should really get a professional cover and a professional edit. But you can really get a book released very cheaply. And I sort of give people the rundown on how to do that. And finally, my go-to line for when people ask me, what do I do, is I write sci-fi, fantasy, and things of that nature. The second sentence, if I get that far, I will make it clear that I self-publish. Because lots of people... Uh, what can I say? I have had people say, hey, well, you got something published. And that's, that's, you know, not a lot of people can do that. Like, well, I didn't get something published. I self-published. So um, uh, despite having had no other job for five years, I still find myself struggling to use the word author to describe myself. It feels more important than I feel. So I say writer, or even more, I say that I write. I say internet marketer sometimes because that's how I feel. And nobody ever asks for details on the vet. Nobody gives a nothing about Facebook ads, you know, unless they have their own business. Uh, I think, Andrea, you have the next question. Oh, do I? I thought From it was Andre. The... Oh, I scrolled down too far. <laughs> okay. And I'm not seeing a question from Andre. I'm seeing one from Letty. All right, I'm going to ask Andre's questions, you know, because I, I have it. <laughs> okay, good, because I'm like, I don't, I don't know where we are in there anymore, sorry. All right, I moved a couple down to the end that were like pizza, favorite pizza and juggling, just so we'd have all the fun stuff at the end. Um, I think it'd be fun. I don't, know, I don't know how Joe feels about the pressure to juggle, but okay. Andre wants to know, I would like to hear some thoughts on marketing short stories, Facebook ads, Amazon ads, etc., also, for beginners who write shorties, how do we build an email list? Last one, how do we get beta readers to read our short stories? Thanks. Okay. Um, if I was going to try to write, like, market just short stories, I would start with a Patreon. It's 
like this is speculative because the short stories came later in my career for me. But uh, I, I recognize if you're just getting started, it'll be hard to get people to join a Patreon without a following, but it would allow you to keep the price low because you can, you know, if you release a book for 99 cents, which is the lowest price you can release that's not free, uh, you're only making 35 cents. But if you're doing it via Patreon, you're making a lot more than that. Plus, people subscribe to it, so you're guaranteeing sales more or less. There's, there's lots of value in using a Patreon for short stuff. Um, you can probably build an email list most effectively by finding anthologies. To we talked about anthologies earlier. If you find anthologies to contribute to, uh, they'll almost always give you an about the author section uh, and uh, you put your stuff in there. If you can spare a short story to give away in exchange for a sign up on your newsletter, then that's what you do in that short section is remind them, hey, if you enjoyed this story, here's another one, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and as for beta readers, it should be very, very easy to get beta readers for short stuff because it's a very small time investment. I would say that you go to um, you go to critique groups. That's basically critique groups are beta readers for short stories in in, in my experience. Uh, and you're going to trade beta reading someone else's thing for them beta reading yours. And uh, I think those are the methods that I would recommend for for going short. Awesome. Okay. So the next question is from Letty Jones. It says, I know Joe writes a lot of short stories. Actually, this is pretty in, in tied through, right? <laughs> um, I love to hear some advice about writing short stories. Do you plan them or pants from the verb to pants them? <laughs> How does writing short stories differ from writing novels? Are they connected or standalone? And are they a good strategy for keeping, for keeping readers engaged or more of a personal hobby? Uh, okay. Um, my planning for a short story doesn't usually extend past a prompt. So patrons will be familiar. I will do periodic polls where it'll have an entry like comfortable dragon or a fat unicorn or a time travel story. And that is literally all that I've thought about the short story until they choose it. And once they choose it, then I start coming up with stuff. I sit down on a Saturday morning and I'll type a paragraph or two of ideas. And if I find that one of those ideas takes more than one paragraph to describe, that's the short story. And I just start writing it. Um, it starts to get, if it starts to get longer than 5,000 words, I will take uh, an afternoon, I would like that afternoon to bullet point out the rest of the story through to con the conclusion because I've had these things turn from an intended 5,000 word story to a 40,000 word novella, which isn't the worst thing in the world because that you can sell that for more. But I try not to do that because that, believe it or not, takes me more than a weekend to write and I don't usually want to budget more than a weekend to something. Um, writing shorts differs from novels in a couple of ways. You can afford to um, you can afford to take your time introducing things. You, sorry, you can't afford to take your time introducing things in a short story. There's just not enough time and room. Uh, you'll, so unless your stakes are very low, uh, you're probably going to have to start right in the middle of something, which is fun because then your reader sort of gets to figure things out as they go. The stories are usually very sudden and urgent problem that needs to be solved, as opposed to something that builds and falls. Or it's a character study where there actually isn't a problem. You're just having a cool, fun moment. Uh, either way, I like. And it, it's just a premise that you stick close to. Most of these are short, sto uh, short stories are standalone. Uh, I've had a few that were popular enough that, that readers wanted sequels. I wrote a story called Wasteland, which uh, is about to have a sequel called Uncle Robot. So like that's the way these things go. And uh, these are, short stories are more of a hobby. Uh, for me than, than it's something to keep me from getting burnt out or falling into a rut. I have a Patreon. The Patreon makes me about 150 bucks a month. I spend almost all of that money on having a nice cover made and making sure these are copy edited before I release them. So that's what makes it a hobby. I'm not earning a ton of money on it. Uh, but yeah, that's, I mean, but it's worthwhile. And eventually I release them as anthologies and the anthologies do earn me a little bit of money on top of that. So that's where I am with those. This is why I've trended towards just using short stories, making them free as a way to get more people <laughs> into my series because I can make so much more on the novels, but nothing wrong with uh, doing it on Patreon and making some extra money that way too. I, I will say that you can almost always, even if you just go out and publish your short stories for 99 cents and um, if you've got a decent reader base, make more than you could by selling it to a magazine. So there's that to consider, <laughs> especially, you know, once you've been at it for a while and you have more readers. But um, moving on, next question is from Sean. Did Joe have a teacher or mentor in his life that he credits for teaching or inspiring him to write? 
Uh, okay, I had a teacher, Mr. Wilbeck, who taught me how to summarize stories. Uh, and I had another teacher, Mrs. Ruain, who taught me how to break ideas down into a, sort of a formula to make sure I get the entire idea into the finished product. Both of those were actually essay writing, but it turns out essay writing and novel writing are just a matter of scale, at least for me. Uh, but the person who probably got me most like started on this was my mom. Uh, when I was little, we would spend a full month camping in Vermont every year. Uh, camping, like we slept in a barn, like it was not a house that we went to up there, at least not until the late 90s. Uh, before that, we were literally sleeping in a barn. There was no TV and there was three boys. And to keep us from tearing each other to pieces, she would uh, ask us to come up with things that we would like to hear stories about. And then uh, at the end of the day, she would make up a story that included all the things we talked about. And we called them ALF stories because they were starring ALF from the show ALF. <laughs> And it basically like that got me thinking about storytelling. And that's certainly what got me actually writing down stuff. So my mom is the answer. Yeah, for moms. My grandpa was the one for me. <laughs> he like was a ghostwriter and he had over 50 books published and nobody still knows which books he wrote and kind of fun. I mean, he had his own books out under his own name too, but most of the time he'd rather write for somebody else and not get the credit. <laughs> Um, okay, so our next question is from Scott C. Morgan. He says, do you have aspirations for a magnum opus to be written later in your career? I know the Book of Deacon is, has been, see, exactly, everybody knows the Book of Deacon, <laughs> is or has been your pillar, pillar series, but is there a future grand work you know or hope to one day create, not to detract from Deacon or any of your others? If so, what will be the catalyst or threshold at, what, at, what point, at which point you'll take on that great project? For example, I'll perhaps one day write an epic fantasy series, but I'll continue honing my craft for, with other work before I take that on. And I want to work on it once I no longer have to worry about income and deadlines. I may pull a Rothfuss time scale on that one. I don't, know, I don't recommend doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I, to, to be perfectly honest, I never really had any aspirations beyond the Book of Deacon trilogy. Like those first three books were like, well, I'll release these and then I'll get that out of my system. So I've, you know, I'm about 30 books past that at this point. Um, even though book six is intended to be the end of the current Book of Deacon arc, the series is not technically over. There's still, I have a prequel that was in the process before I started writing this. That's still going to come out. And there's probably going to be a, an entire separate arc uh, set far enough in the future for it to be a standalone series. So the Book of Deacon might be my magnum opus. I mean, <laughs> when all is said and done, that might be the thing that did it is, is you know, many thousands of words in that one setting. If I, uh, if you want to talk about what, I will write if and when I no longer have to worry about making money off of it. Um, I've got a couple of projects that will make Pizza Dragon and Between, which is another failure of mine, uh, sound like biz like sound business decisions. Uh, my friend has got me working on a ripoff of Ready Player One, uh, which the official file name for that is Ripoff Player One. <laughs> Obviously, that's not going to be a money maker, <laughs> um, but. Honestly, if we're talking about the thing that's like my throw my hat over the fence, the thing I, w I would consider myself a success if I achieved it, I'm really going to be thinking of a different medium, like uh, an animated series or a multi-volume graphic novel. Like those are the sort of things that I would, I would really, really love to make and I just can't justify at the moment. I don't know. Rip off of Ready Player One, that lit, lit RPG genre is pretty hot and can only limited. Maybe, you know, it's oh, pretty yeah. close to epic fantasy. So like your readership would probably go right over to that. Well, my friend will be very happy to know that because he's really pushing hard for me to finish it. <laughs> All right. Uh, before moving on to the next question, I just wanted to comment on teachers and like how powerful it is if you have somebody that says like, dude, your writing is awesome or you're good at this one thing. Like my, I had a 10th grade teacher. She was like a nut. Nobody liked her classes. I didn't even like her the classes that much, but she'd say like, you know, oh, you got this rape to your wit. It's really good. You know, really work on this. And I still remember that. And I always feel bad for people that didn't have a teacher like that. You know, because I also had on the other side, people were like, you can't make a living writing, go into computer science or business, you know? So it's, it's just, it's really like if you are a teacher and you have somebody that has even the faintest inkling of anything, you know, or even if you don't, I think if you encourage people, you can like help bring that to pass. Like it really sticks with people. So. All right. Lane asks, do you have a specific word count or amount of time that you set aside for yourself to write each day? 
Uh, I I go by uh, I would go by word counts. I I aim for three thousand or five thousand words, depending on what my schedule is looking like. Um, so three thousand is standard, and I can, can hit it very comfortably. Like that, three thousand is, is the number of words I'm trying to get when I'm trying to have like a work day, and then leisure time schedule. Um, five thousand words is when it's like I'm trying to get an entire novel done in a month. Uh, because again, technically it's, it's whatever, 17,000 words to do the NaNoWriMo thing, 1,700 words rather a day to do the NaNoWriMo thing, but I, uh, I write longer than that. So 5,000 is what I aim for, uh, for crazy times. If I hit my goal early, say before 2 p.m., I usually, if I don't have any pressing book biz to handle, I'll pour some of the rest of the time into brainstorming future stuff or writing short stories or i'll just decide oh, okay three thousand was easy for me today so let's make it five thousand i'm a strong proponent of if you're on a roll keep rolling i agree with that um it it i don't know like even in dictating and sometimes if i'm really really on a roll and i have no time left i'll leave it like on a cliffhanger so that i can you know be excited about it again the next day you know and a cliffhanger for an author is a real thing <laughs> Um, okay, so our next question is from RK Dreaming, which is, by the way, a fantastic pen name. I don't know why. I just love that so much. Um, what does he do if he ever gets demotivated with the writing? How often does it happen, and how does he get out of it? I am in a perpetual cycle of falling into and out of writing motivation. Uh, for me, if I'm really struggling on a project, I will sideline it for a full week. I'll just be like, I am not going to make any words in this project this week. And I will spend that week either producing something small, as you've heard, I do a lot of short stories. Um, uh, and those will end up as part of the Patreon or as standalone novellas or as newsletter sign up things. Uh, if, my, if it's a sort of a, uh, of a hiccup in the middle of a day, I will do some combination of the following. I will listen to music with the same tone as the intended scene that I am writing. And I have playlists for different types of scenes. Uh, I will do a long walk or I will start writing in longhand. I have pads all around me right now. Uh, and it, it will literally be, I am such a slow writer. I'm left-handed and I was not taught to write left-handed. So I don't write well. Uh, I'm so slow that I will get impatient just trying to get the first sentence down of writing longhanded. And I'll be like, I'll just type it. And it's amazing how effectively that gets me back into typing the thing. It's just like, Oh, I just want to get this one idea down. And then it just breaks the, the, you know, the rut that I was in. So it's a weird psychological thing, but writing down anything longhand gets me back on the keyboard pretty quick. I didn't know you were left-handed. My husband's left-handed. <laughs> My dad's left-handed. I'm not left-handed. Sorry. <laughs> that is uh, interesting about the writing though. I often find that like as I get later in a series, it's like a real struggle sometimes to keep up the motivation for that because you're already thinking like of the next series you want to do. And sometimes I have to just like, well, I'm going to just step over here and plot out this book I have an idea for and then I'll go back to the other one. And then that's like the reward thing that's dangling like, okay, you get to write that book, but not until you finish this series. But I haven't tried writing anything by hand for a while. So that is about it for our serious questions for the last few minutes of the show. For anybody who's actually listened to all hour and 15 minutes or whatever we're at, Craig asks, what is your favorite pizza? Okay, I, I grew up and still live in New Jersey where pizza is a thing. Uh, it's a big question for me. We're, I'm the kind of guy who has a favorite pizza from each of the various pizzerias that I order from. Uh, all of these, unless otherwise noted, are what you would call a New York style pizza. Uh, uh, I look it up. I have a hard time describing it because to me, it's just a pizza. Uh, pepperoni is an old standby. I like pepperoni. When we order from Ciro's, which is the place we order from most often, pepperoni is the standard. Uh, I like buffalo chicken pizza from Oakwood Pizza. <laughs> that is a fantastic uh, uh, local place with a fantastic type of pizza. There's a place called Luna's that has a fantastic grandma pie, which if you're not familiar, is sort of a thin crust Sicilian. Uh, there's a place in my own hometown called Joe's Pizza, which has got the best Sicilian. Uh, Three Brothers, also very good Sicilian. I do like, a, a, by the way, a Hawaiian pie. So the whole question of does pineapple belong on pizza, for me, the answer is yes. And if I'm feeling particularly fancy, uh, the Supreme from LaGuardiola or the Fruity de Mar from LaGuardiola or the garbage pie from what is unfortunately the defunct Rocco's Pizzeria. So those are my pizzas. They're, I take them very seriously. 
you know, I'm not a huge pineapple on pizza person, but I also don't really like most things on pizza. I'm like, just give me meat. <laughs> and That's Lindsay's fair. talking about, talking about actually that, the, you know, the more protein keto type pizzas in the chat. Yummy. Yeah. And by but, the way, I'm starving. <laughs> I have lost like the, 20 pounds recently and talking about pizza is mean. <laughs> <laughs> for the record, the keto pizza has to have no crust. <laughs> it would just oh, be the cheese and the meat. <laughs> it's true. Good point. <laughs> Oh man. Okay, Joe. Um, we are ready to see you juggle. Are you ready okay. to juggle? I got prepare to not be impressed because it's not fancy at all. But I'm gonna go juggle. This for for people who are listening, you're probably not even gonna hear us. We'll probably edit it out. But the well, no, YouTube we'll, we'll narrate it for you. Don't <laughs> oh, worry. Fantastic. Take your headphones no. off and don't worry about it. We got we it can't covered. have <laughs> we can't talk because then he won't be on the screen for the YouTube. So he has to actually come oh. back and talk again. Okay, well, we'll talk till he's got his tools. Okay, there he goes. Can you hear us, Joe? Joe, 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 no, Joe, no, no, Joe, juggle. It's still on you. <laughs> oh, man. How He has to make noise. He's going to he have does. to like grunt and jump up and down while he juggles. <laughs> all right. He, it was very exciting for those who did not see it, which is all of you. <laughs> so, Joe... You have to grunt and make noises or something because Zoom didn't switch to you because there was no noise coming from your end. Oh, well, hold on. Let me see. I got to do this. I think you're going to have to do it with your headset on. Can you do it? <laughs> this, will, this will be interesting. Hold can on. Can you do it at your desk or sitting? I can't do it. Well, actually, I can do it sitting, but I have to do it facing Don't that Don't strangle way yourself. Desk. Okay. We're going to be quiet Stand now. By. Okay. <laughs> He's preparing himself. He's not going to strangle yourself. Okay. okay. There you go. Um, how far can I get? This will be interesting. Never done before. Added the cord adds to the degree of difficulty. It does. I can't actually do yeah, it like that. Yeah, that's the cord is a problem. <laughs> okay. All right, hold on. Okay, let's just have thing. Joe talk then, and no, neither uh -huh. of us talk, and then just All let right, it be I'm on just Joe. In video, you go. can I do that? Okay. See if this works. That was awesome. Excellent. Hopefully the three people still watching on YouTube were able to be entertained. That was good that you could do the two in one hand with both left and right. Cause I could do it with the right when I was learning as a kid, but not, I never even tried the left. The left hand is, well, you're left-handed. So maybe that's your secret power. <laughs> yeah, but I can, then I have to do it with my right. Uh, well, you just have secret powers. Just secret. No, I have, what I have is procrastination. <laughs> I'll get up and, and, and juggle for who knows how long. So I have power over the video idiot. So we're going to see how much actually shows up in the video. <laughs> All right. Well, we did actually have one last question from Bill. Uh, can we see what's in your cabinet? So um, I'm not sure how we're going to. Can you? How difficult it was for me to, uh, for, for me to back away with my headset on. <laughs> um, I will link to you a video uh, tour that I did of the cabinet. Um, I guess if I want to really get fancy, let's see what happens if I try this. Stand by. Yeah, I could do this with a laptop, but I don't know if you've got a legit computer monitor there. That's going to be hard. Now we're I'm admiring. Where to go. Uh, I got your ceiling light. That looks nice. Okay, this is about as far as I'm going to be able to get. So. Okay, there's, we see stuff. We see now, some and now stuff. I see oh, Lindsay. We got a mute. Got a mute. Okay, so we got, there's some hats and stuff. Here are some uh, uh, um, figurines. That's Blot from, from the Urban Fantasy series right there in the front. And over there, I think we can probably see Miranda. But yeah, I have a much better, a much better video that I've done with my phone, which I will link to for our YouTube friends that will teach you all sorts of stuff. And I'll probably do a new one because there's a lot of new stuff in there since the last time I recorded one. Is that like a book cover on the wall to your left? Um, oh yeah. Well, I guess I can still do this. Over here is the, the Book of Deacon cover. I, my friends threw a, a, a anniversary party for me for the 10th anniversary of that book's release. So they gave me the cover on, you know, framed. And then they did one over there for uh, Bypass Gemini and then back there. You can barely see it. There's one for free wrench. And then my brother-in-law, uh, my sorry, my brother had his friend draw me as a dragon rider for a, a groomsman gift when he got married. 
That's, That's awesome. pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I like the Afghan. Did you like you have a oh, yeah, mo mother or grandmother that knitted that? Because I have one of those that was from my grandmother. I feel like that's the that was the style for that a long is from time. My grandma, yeah. Yeah, that's the grandma style right there. <laughs> All right, that was fun. All right, now we're down to two listeners. <laughs> so, um, actually, Andrea had one more question before we wrap up. I forgot about your. It's a serious question, not just. Oh. A goofy question. And and by the way, I'm sure our listeners will probably agree because I was a former listener. My favorite episodes were these kinds of episodes. <laughs> so I think it depends on your taste as a listener. Because I'm like, when I hear a podcast and they're talking about dumb stuff for the first five minutes, I'm so gone. Like, I might jump in like 15 minutes to see if they got down to business, but I only want the information. But thank you. All for right. Sure. We'll, we'll let our listeners decide. Did All you right. like this or not? <laughs> there you go. Now we're down to one that's still listening. So he'll be, <laughs> he or she will be the person deciding. Okay. So we still have plans to do a visual Joe episode. And I know you're wait you were waiting for your Kickstarter person to get finished with that. Um, but what got you interested in art for your books? And have you always been interested in art? Uh, okay. Well, first the Kickstarter is done and they, they raised uh three hundred and fifty thousand dollars out of an eighty thousand dollar goal so good for them i'll try to get them involved iron circus animation is the thing that was related to and fable seagull is the other person associated i'm going to try to talk to both of them now that they're not running a kickstarter but uh, i've always been a very visual storyteller my writing sessions are more like watching movies in my head and then describing them so it's always been super duper visual for me. I'm perpetually picturing things, but I have no real artistic skill. Once a year I'll do uh, Inktober and I'll try to draw something at once a day for an entire month. But uh, seeing other people turn my words into images has always been mind blowing to me. And it's jump started basically by the first that cover that you just saw. Uh, once I got that and I went through the process of making it, I got hopelessly hooked on having art done for my stuff. And I've been interested in art forever. In grammar school, I was in talented art, which is an, uh, it was a during the day extracurricular activity. So I missed two uh, periods of history class per week in order to be in talented art. And uh, I was the worst artist by far in the club, but I ke they kept letting me back in because I was creative. Like I would not be able to meet the brief, but I would use the art supplies to do something else, which the following year would be an actual project because they're like, oh, well that worked out really well. It's not what we told you to do. Uh, so yeah, art's been a big thing for me forever. That's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm, I've come like from an artistic background. I was a professional artist before I even started writing. So I was doing commission paintings and things like that. So it's kind of, it's fun. I mean, it's awesome. Like when I started listening to the, the previous podcast, I was like, ah, he's into art. That's so cool. Anyway, so that's pretty much it for this episode. Um, is there any last thing where you want people to go look you up? Anything like that? Um, I'm J R L A L L O on most of the places that you can look for me. Uh, if I'm not that, then I'm Joseph underscore Lalo on Instagram is the only one I couldn't get my regular name for. Uh, you can find my website at bookofdeacon.com. Uh, I'm one of those people who named my website after the one book I thought I'd write instead of my author name. So <laughs> get another thing on that list. And uh, if you're interested in my stuff, until the end of May, I have got my full main series for the Book of Deacon uh, on discount, and the first book is free. So that's search, search, for, search on the store of your choice for Book of Deacon, and, and you'll find the stuff discounted there. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay, yeah, thank you for letting us interview you, and thank you to our listeners um, for hanging into the end, all one of you, as Lindsay was saying. Um, and thanks to Josh for, Joshua Pearson. Sorry, I'm like, Josh, thanks, Josh, for producing the show. Um, and you can find the show notes or leave a comment or question at sixfigureauthors.com with the number six and come join our Facebook group. And yeah, we'll talk to you all later. Bye. Bye, everyone. So long, everybody.